What's up, guys? My name is Trevor Jamison from Motion Auto TV, and you guys are listening to The Builder Sessions. Welcome to The Builder Sessions with Hoff and Rosie, a podcast where we chat with your favorite builders. We get to know them, their stories, and hopefully inspire you to get off the couch and build something cool. On this episode, we talk with Trevor Jamison from Motion Auto TV. We talk about how he got into automotives, his YouTube journey, we discuss social media versus reality, we talk about his dream builds, and we even get some social media strategy in there. All this and more on this episode of The Builder Sessions. We hope you enjoy. Trevor, welcome to the Builder Sessions. It's awesome to have you here. Yeah, how are you guys doing? Doing good. We are under a snow watch, surprise, surprise, up in Canada, where um, we have a snowfall warning, a snow storm warning or whatever, or wa- watch, whichever one's the worst. <laughs> yeah. Is it watch or and warning? And it's cold. <laughs> yeah, and it's damn cold. So that's how we're doing. How are you doing? Oh, good. Uh, so I'm here in Colorado, and it's like, it was almost 60 degrees today. It's a little windy, but I was just playing musical cars outside, shuffling, shuffling everything around, trying to organize and get cars into the shop. I couldn't even move. Like I couldn't even get cars out because they were blocked in by other cars. So was uh was messing with that. So now the shop is all cleaned up. It's ready, ready for some work. So I'm excited for tomorrow. I think we're supposed to actually get some snow tonight too, like six to eight inches or something. So wow. we'll see how that goes. So we were living in similar climates. You're, you're, mm-hmm. I think you guys are nicer. getting it first. Yeah, 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 yeah. But your your um, scenery is a lot nicer. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> we're flat maybe, land I hope here. So. <laughs> yeah, we're flat. Really? We we can see the mountains in the distance, but we're not like in the red rock. Awesome that you are. Yeah, so that I mean that's literally exactly how it is. It, here I'm on the plains, and you pretty much look out, and like the mountains are 25, 30 minutes away. Well, that's not bad. That's about the same. Yeah. Well, we're about maybe an hour. Anyways, <laughs> Trevor, for our listeners um, who don't know who you are, I'm familiar with yourself and your YouTube channel and all your all the amazing projects you've done over the years. Um, can you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Trevor Jameson. I'm uh, 30 years old. I'm from Southern Colorado. I have uh, two kids, two two daughters. I got a five year old and a two and a half year old. Um, both girls and uh, and they're crazy. Keep my toes. Um, I uh, have the Motion Auto TV YouTube channel. Uh, right now we're close to six hundred and fifteen thousand subscribers. Uh, I've been making videos on YouTube for about twelve years. Uh, many different variations of videos. Uh, you know, just some started off with me working in the garage, and then you know, eventually working with some employees and some friends, and uh, then it turned into kind of apparel and car giveaways. And now we do, I feel like it's everything, e-com, we do, I mean, it's, it's just wild. So um, a lot of, uh, a lot of subjects, uh, but everything pretty much revolves around cars and uh, working on them. So, so Trevor with, uh, can you kind of provide, if we rewind a little bit, um, how did you get into wrenching car building? Did you do it at a younger age? Can you kind of explain on how you kind of got into this um, passion, I guess? Yeah. So me and my, I mean, it, I think for a lot of, you know, boys, when you're growing up, it's just RC cars, it's hot wheels, uh, it's bicycles, it's pretty much, and that's how I was literally like, I was addicted to cars, like it didn't matter if it wasn't even cars, it was anything with wheels is pretty much what it was like me and my brother used to argue over who who got to mow the lawn, because it had wheels and an engine on it. <laughs> that's awesome. And like, I remember walking into the stores, like in when it was snowing, and looking at the tire tread on the ground and I'm like, oh, that's like a monster truck, you know, because it had like like some, you know, some F-250 had mud trains or something on it. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. was just so stoked on anything with wheels. I mean, it didn't matter what it was. Um, and so my dad was actually a mechanic uh, at the time. He worked, uh, you know, I guess as far back as I can remember, he worked at Fears. 
um, in their, you know, automotive department. And so he was doing, you know, like the oil changes and the maintenance and, and all that, or that's at least what I think he was doing back then. I honestly haven't asked him what he did there. I just knew that he worked there and we always had, um, you know, like a single car garage at our house. There was always a truck in there torn apart. And then he was always changing oil, like out in the street, you know, like we, we didn't have a driveway. We had like the street. So like cars were driving by and he's laying underneath the, the truck, changing his own oil and, uh, you know, working on our grandma's cars. <laughs> he's got two and wheels up on the curb instead of jack stands. Yeah. Just stuff like just sketchy, <laughs> you know, like cars were driving by almost running over his legs. And like, I was riding my bicycle down the street and it was like, uh, you know, I had one of those wagons, you know, uh, just like with the, the bigger, like pneumatic tires. Oh, yeah. And me and my brother built these little ramps and it was like, we thought we were evil, evil Knievel riding down the street on our bikes, hitting this ramp, jumping over the wagon, you know? And, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's always been there. It's just weird. And, uh, you know, he'd be working in the garage on that truck that was always apart. And I would be like right next to him with my bike, like upside down, you know, taking off the wheel and just trying to do something, you know, mechanically. And, um, so it, it's, it's, pretty much always been there ever since I could remember. And then as I got closer to, um, you know, middle school, uh, RCs was kind of the big thing oh, yeah. that uh, kind of threw me into actually working and kind of, you know, understanding how everything worked together. Uh, we had the nitro, uh, it was, um, a Traxxas. It was a T-Max nice. and I bought one and I bought it used and, it was a project, you know, I bought it off eBay. I was buying and selling random things on eBay at the time. And, uh, this was back in like 2007. Um, you know, like way back in the day, I think I was maybe a freshman in high school or something. And so would just like buy and sell stuff on eBay would, you know, basically anything I could to do to make money to, to buy dirt bikes and parts and, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, ended up buying that RC car had it worked great for like the first hour you know and then after that like a bunch of issues i just started breaking stuff and then that's really when i started learning about tuning but uh we ended up blowing up the engine my dog grabbed it and you know kind of shook the tire we had a rottweiler at the time uh and it the air filter came off of it and it sucked in you know some dirt and it seized the engine you know and then it was like a couple weeks or whatever until i saved enough money and i ended up buying another engine for it so that was my first engine swap was my <laughs> my little uh traxxas t-max overnight uh, parts you know, from traxxas <laughs> the cool thing was is we actually had a local um a local little rc shop oh nice and that was like my, my favorite place you know because this was uh, 2007 i mean the internet was there but it wasn't wasn't like you clicked buy now and everything. There were still them little hobby shops and stuff. Um, so it was cool to go in there and look at all the parts and the tools and you'd see the new, you know, the, the Revo, you know, like all the new, the new cars and stuff there. And you're like, Oh, I want that one. The new HPI and, uh, trucks and the new, Oh yeah. I was into that too a little bit. Yeah. And my, you know, I had the Traxxas, my brother had the HPI, you know, and we yeah. would race, race them down the street. And that was, what that's when everything just started to click um, oh, okay right after that uh you know i mean it it was also the same thing like when uh like i said addicted like literally like addicted to anything with wheels we would go to um, friends and family or whoever my uncles they were really cool and uh, my uncle always had hot rods and you know was just building uh, he has like a 37 ford coupe that he has like a small block 400 and a blower and he custom painted it did all that stuff with it and so he was always into hot rods my dad was always into like more mechanical stuff not really like performance stuff mm -hmm. but you know me i just wanted to go fast i wanted something cool and uh just i wanted to drive anything anything and everything like i would have teachers you know i would like one of my teachers had like an audi a8 or something which was like this really weird long boat european looking thing and it was actually a substitute. And I was just like, can I drive your car? You know, and I was like in middle school. I was like, I want to drive your car because I just thought it was a super car. And that was like, I was that like annoying kid. I'd go to my uncle's house and I'd be like, hey, can I, can I drive your truck? You know, because he'd like let me steer it and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was kind of it. I, I know the thing that really got me into actually working on them was my great grandma car i actually had an uncle that built all the hot rods he in uh 
obviously when she died, great grandma, she was, you know, got old. I, I never actually really met her. Uh, but she bought a 72 Datsun 510 uh, from the local Nissan dealership, basically brand new. Nice. Um, at, which is crazy because it's from the town, you know, that I currently live in. I was born and raised here. And the dealership that is still, that's still alive is where she bought that Datsun. Um, and so when I was 14 years old, he had had that. He had just inherited it. It got out of, you know, whatever sort of place it was stored or whatever. And so he just got like four or five cars that were kind of like stuck. I don't know if they were in a warehouse or in somebody's yard in another state. But anyhow, like he gave me that 72 Datsun 510. No way. And that was like, and it's a two door. It's a four, you know, it was the four <laughs> speed. Um, and I didn't know what I got. Like, I just thought, I was like, okay, cool. I have this rear wheel drive manual car i don't know anything about it and at the time i thought it was the lamest thing in the world but like it had so much potential and so i started looking around you know i started that was i had a, a laptop at the time and you know i'm like 14 years old so get on the internet you get on the 240sx forums or the Datsun forums and i start seeing engine swaps you know people are putting sr20s and this oh, yeah. this ka engine in um and you know these vgs and people are doing these side draft weber carburetors and this electronic ignition and and all these things and um and i just i spent hours just going through build threads and i'm just like how how am i going to build this car like i don't know i don't really know what i'm doing my uncle did he knew how to do like paint and bodywork and engine swaps and all that stuff and um uh, he was the one who gave me the car so uh it sat around for a couple months and basically one day we pulled it in the garage. I, I called my uncle over. It's crazy because he, he literally only came and helped me for two afternoons. He came over one day. It had like some rust on the bottom and we started cutting out the, the rust and making these patch panels. And um, he never even showed me how to spread body filler, but I like got on these forums and was just like searching anything I could, you know, cause back in the day, it, it wasn't like YouTube now where you could just get on and type in how to do body work. And there's, 10 people, you know, or a hundred people making videos, like kind of like I am now, I kind of try to show people. Um, but there wasn't that back then it was like, you know, you had to buy this guy's course or you had to buy this book or it was like this big secret, you yeah. know, of, of how to paint cars. And all I wanted to do was paint that thing like lime green or orange or whatever it was, yeah. you know, cause I had a, a Kawasaki dirt bike at the time. And so, uh, yeah, that was kind of what started it. He helped me uh, cut them patch panels. And then I didn't even show me how to spread body filler or anything. I literally went to Walmart, got a can of bod like Bondo and like went home and mixed it and like waited for it to get hard. And I was like, okay, crap, I guess I have to sand this now. And uh, then started looking into, you know, engine swaps and the K swaps. So I, I think I technically had that thing running and driving and painted uh, lime green when I was like 16 or 17 years old. And it, so it had a K 24 DE fuel injection, um, and lime green, it had wheels and, you know, suspension and all kinds of stuff on it. And that was really like, that was it. And, um, I feel like I'm kind of going a little bit off topic, but, uh, oh, this is no, perfect. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. But it, it just can, I mean, if you want me to keep going, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. explain it because it's go for it, man. Those are the best. Please and, tell me you have it still. Oh yeah, no, it's okay, it's good. sitting in my, my garage. If you guys get on my Instagram right now, uh, there's actually it's funny. We just posted a, a reel. Uh, I don't know if you guys post many reels on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, we just posted a reel. Uh, obviously, that body filler that I put on there was it almost 16 years ago. Um, there's a big chunk of it that I just pried off of it. You know, I'm gonna make it one of these days. I'm gonna go back and fully, fully restore it again because I. I didn't do a great job, um, but that's where I learned. I mean, literally everything that I know was because I was trying it out on that car just because I was just like, I have this lame, you know, car that has all of this potential. So I need to do this stuff to it. And um, so, yeah, like I, I made a, a reel on Facebook of me like using my pocket knife to pop off this big old chunk of Bondo, like the the size of a, a plate, you know, and uh, it, it has like a million views. So that's just it's just funny how, you know, the internet works. Yeah, but, the stuff uh, that you don't think is even going to do anything, it blows up. And then the stuff you're proud of just gets like 10 views. It, yeah, it's silly. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's like, I don't know. It's it, it's a weird thing. I've I've really been trying to hit the, the Instagram reels and the Facebook reels and some of that stuff. Just the short form content 
is is in it. But I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later, I guess. But uh, yeah, so it, it was running and driving KA swap. Uh, then I started looking into like drifting. Yeah. Obviously, I was on all the 240SX forums looking at, you know, SR20s and KA swaps and like how to wire a KA and, you know, how to turbo a KA and what ECU you got to use and use these SR20 injectors. I'm like, well, what's an SR20? So you start looking all that stuff up. You search SR20, you look in, then you all of a sudden drifting pops up. And I'm just like, oh man, like we have a local drag strip uh, that I actually did some high school uh, drag racing stuff with. As I was like working on the Datsun, uh, I didn't want it to be my first paint job. I bought this, uh, it was a 90, it was an 89 5.0 like Fox body hatchback, like the LX with an auto and it ran oh, a yeah. 17 second pass, but bought it, uh, big Craigslist guy. Like that was me. I was, just, I was buying and selling. <laughs> anything that i could and you know honda civics and all that stuff and so i i bought this mustang i painted it within a week because i wanted a, a practice paint job before i painted my dots and so technically the mustang was like my first first person paint job but it was like single stage and i painted it yellow but bought it on sunday and we worked on it monday tuesday wednesday thursday and friday during the day and we went to the friday night drags uh that night with it painted yellow so less than a week from when i bought it um i painted it you know but that was like my first practice paint job that's and it awesome didn't, needed some decent body work but i was like I, before i paint the dots and i want to at least get one one under my belt <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. and so you know my uncles and stuff they knew about drag racing and the drag racing was really the only thing that i knew of you know as far as like car racing but so i was familiar with the drag racing i did the high school drags and the mustang ran a 17 second pass it was automatic it was just i was just bored you know i was just like i like i'm literally in the car for 17 seconds it's not even a cool 17 seconds <laughs> like i want to do something else you know I'm, i was into dirt bikes and bmx and you know kind of that style so you kind of have that like like snowboarding and um, i like sliding you know like we had four wheelers at the time and I loved going out on the like the roads. We had some dirt roads behind our house, and I would literally just like power slide them. We I couldn't wait for it to snow because you'd go out there and do donuts and just slide the four wheeler around. And I was like, this is literally the exact same thing in a car. Mm -hmm. And so then my my search, you know, on uh, Craigslist turned into like two forty SXs, you know, and yeah, um, all that stuff. So uh, ended up finding a a two forty and um, started. Uh, Basically, that was my first drift car build. Um, it was a S13 hatch, had like these Integra tail lights, had this knocking KA in it that I like ended up rebuilding and turboing and doing a bunch of stuff. But kind of, I guess, what I, where I'm going with that was I was on the, or I guess the progression from that into kind of where I'm at now is I was on the, the Facebook, or not Facebook groups, the forums. It's Facebook groups now, which aren't very much... Not, they're not anything compared to the the forms back oh, in the day. The, the forms, forms were freaking the awesome. Unless and unless you ask so the like, same question like that, eight million people did, and they just roast you and say, "Have you searched yet?" <laughs> but the nice thing about it was is that if you actually searched, the information oh, was exactly. there, exactly, and it was awesome. And I feel like, man, on Facebook groups now, there's so much lost information because the questions get asked so many times, and it's yep. like the search feature on a Facebook group is a lot different than it was in a forum, you know, where you would have like a thread and people would constantly update that thread and people would have a build thread so you could keep up with their builds, you know, and there would mm. be, I, I can't tell you how many nights I spent scrolling through, you know, 40, 50 page build threads of Datsuns or Nissan two forties or trucks or whatever, you know, just, just looking at it, looking at what parts they're buying, where are they buying these parts? And so that's where I turned to YouTube, you know, because I, I I wrote a couple articles, I guess, on the internet, um, or a, a couple build thread things. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to figure out how to make money on the internet. There was this website called eHow, where you used to write articles, and they would pay you based upon like the ad rates that was on there. Oh, cool. And I was just like, well, if people are making money, like I'm making money, I was making like a hundred dollars a month from eHow. Um, and my, my first article on there was the best one. It was how to buy cheap cars on Craigslist. Um, but I made a hundred dollars a month on this 
for this article that I wrote this one time. Holy I was like, smokes. okay, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really into like writing. Like I didn't like typing. Like I wanted to do video stuff. Like that's where I wanted. I wanted like my own automotive TV show because everything that you've seen, the only automotive content you really got was on like Motor Trend, you know, or like some automotive TV show. And it was always they were rebuilding a, a C10 or a 69 must or 69 Camaro or a 65 Mustang, you know, it was like, it was always the same stuff. Yep. The classic and cliche nobody was cars. Really doing exactly. Or, the, you know, they were lifting my Ford Bronco or, you know, <laughs> just the stereo. And then when the car would accelerate away from you, it wasn't even the right sound. That's the thing that like, you know, cause again, I was, I was addicted. I knew exactly what a 69 Camaro was supposed to sound like with a big block. And it didn't sound like that, you know? Like, yeah. 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 So I was just like, man, I, I could like, I could do that. Like I have YouTube, like I have YouTube now I could, I could upload videos and instead of a build thread on a forum, I'll just make a video build thread. And so, yeah, the, the motion auto TV, YouTube channel that I actually started it in 2010, but my previous YouTube channel, I started in 2007. Um, and it was just that started off because I was selling a dirt bike on Craigslist. I uploaded a video to Craigslist with uh, a link to the video of the dirt bike running. I was just like, okay, check out like my, actually at the time it was when Craigslist, you could, you could do your own HTML theme. Okay. And so I embedded the YouTube link, like the video on the Craigslist page. So I'm like, oh, I'm selling my, you know, Kawasaki KX100, you know, the, the lime green one that inspired the Datsun. Um, I'm selling this thing. So I literally uploaded a video of it. Idle 144p. You played on your, your computer now, like there's square blocks of color, <laughs> you know, like you can barely tell it's a dirt bike. Um, it's just, but it's crazy. That video got 300,000 views. Like, and it's, it's, it's wild, but that was my very first vi YouTube video was that. Um, and then as I, tra you know, was working on my dots and, and kind of updating a build thread, then I, kind of mostly when the Datsun was kind of more so getting finished or, or done before I painted it, which I kind of did a bad job at documenting it as far as video wise, because I was trying to do a build thread. Um, that's when I said, okay, let's, let's actually start an automotive YouTube channel, an automotive, you know, build thread YouTube channel. And, um, and that's kind of, you know, where I guess it, it all transitioned to into, you know, now, also, I guess there's another thing, like I said, trying to make money on the internet Yeah, was the YouTube. At the time, there was, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know how long you guys have been around on, on the whole YouTube thing, but up actually in Canada, there was this channel, it was called David's Farm. And uh, we would sit down and watch his videos and he would build this like redneck roller coaster and he just like would get oh, this. Oh, I've heard of this guy. You know? Yeah, I've never seen it. I've heard yep. of him for sure. And so he, that was like OG, OG YouTube. And he was literally just making videos of him and like his friends and these like people on his like 40 acre farm, like building cars and just messing around. And then he made a video of like how much money I make on YouTube or, and he just like broke down the whole like YouTube partner program. And I was like, you can make money on YouTube. And, uh, uh you know, cause that was kind of at the same time that I was doing the, the, e the, those eHow articles. So this was actually before I started motion auto. And so I was watching him. He said he could make money on YouTube. He kind of broke down, broke it down. And that at that time, it wasn't like automatic. Like it wasn't like you could just start uploading videos. You had to like apply to YouTube. Like you had to be, it was, I forget all of the requirements, but it was, it was a job. Like it was almost, I think a year before I got monetized really? on the motion, the motion auto channel. Yeah. Because you had to have a certain amount of uploads, a certain amount of subscribers, and like they had to actually go manually review your channel. And uh, it was wow. like a big deal to be like on this partner program. Yeah, no and it kidding. Was, so yeah, it was pretty cool. And then yeah, ever since then, it's just been, you know, a progression of, you know, I was at the time when I started the channel, I was working it out of my dad's garage. He had a, or we had a three car garage at the, at the house. It was a different house than what we grew up in. Um, from third grade, when I was basically 10 years old, we moved to a different house. Uh, then we had like, like, you know, like two acres of land and we had dirt roads behind our house and we had a three car garage and, um, it looked like a used car lot outside of it. Cause all the, 
all the stuff we had because my dad was buying and selling things, my brother was buying and selling stuff, I was buying and selling stuff, and it was just it was just wild. Uh, we all had a bay in the garage. That's but awesome. I was the one who was out there the family. most. Like I just yeah, it was uh, it was cool and it was like a little competition because my brother was making YouTube videos too at the time. He actually got on the partner program before me, and uh, so it was just like a challenge. I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna like because I was making the eHow articles. And then he was working towards this like YouTube partner program. And I was just like, no, like my, my articles are doing good. And he's like, no YouTube videos. And then I, tr I transitioned to YouTube and then now, now he's, he still has a channel, but he doesn't really do anything. He got a job, but now, now, now YouTube is, is my life. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. And it's cool that you can make a living at it now. Yeah. It's uh, it's wild. I mean, I, I don't know what, people you guys watch on YouTube or, you know, anybody who your audience is with, but yeah, it's, it's a whole, it's a business like, and it's a job too. It's, it's way different than I would have. I don't know. It was like, I never really thought of it. Like it, it just turned into it, you know, because I was doing what I had to do. So it was like, because we're, you know, now making money on the videos or, you know, like, how do we build something cooler or how do I get to build this car and not have a whole bunch of money in it? So then you, it turns into like sponsor things, but then you're like, well, how do, why is a sponsor going to want to work with me? Well, mm -hmm. hopefully I have, you know, a good audience and I have a good, good reach and I have, you know, good views on the videos. And so it just turns into this just ecosystem of just, I mean, it just turns into a business is what it, what it does. Um, there's a lot of people who have channels, you know, that like do them in their garage and they do them small as kind of a part-time thing, but to, to run a successful YouTube channel full-time, like with employees, you know, it's, it's tough. And that's, uh, especially I think a little bit tougher now, because when I first started, I was the only, like, not the only one, but like I was early. You know, I was really early in the like automotive YouTube uh, pool, you know, and then now you have a lot of big, big companies with big money. You know, you have like Hoonigan or Donut Media or even just other creators that have hit success sooner. So like their content is just exponential, um, you know, and it's so like that was kind of, I guess the reason I kind of refer to that is I was just like, on a TV show back in the day, you would see a whole entire build of a car in let's say like, I don't know how long it would actually take one of those shops to, oh, to yeah. build it, you like know, overhauling but, like seven days. Yeah. Like, but I don't know if it actually took him seven days or if it was six months, but it was like a half of the episode. Yeah. It was like, they would roll in the car. It would, they would tear it all apart. And then all of a sudden, like they would roll it out of the paint booth and it was painted and then it was running and driving and they were getting the reaction of the owner. There was never the process. Like mm -hmm. that was the thing that I always got hung up on is there was no process of it. Like I wanted to see how much body filler they were putting on it. I wanted to see how they, you know, they wired in that fuel injection to that old car and ran the fuel lines and stuff like that. Um, and literally it was, it was, there was none of that. Like all of the details were gone. It was just like the, okay, we have a terrible car. We have a big problem. Here's a little bit of the progress. And now here it is the customer it's running and driving and you guys didn't see the last six months of work, you know, like is how I felt. But, and I almost feel like that's kind of like, that's what I didn't want YouTube to be. And that's what I was like most proud of. I was like, cool. Like I could build a car in six months. I could take my time. I could show people the process. I could take my time on it. Whereas I feel like now it's like almost people are building cars fast yeah. on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's like, I don't know if, if that inspires people or if it like discourages people, you know, like, you know how like people look at like people on Instagram and they're like, they, they, see how skinny and fit they are. So then they like, they have like an eating disorder then, you know, because they're like, I want to be just like them. Like, do you guys think that happens in like the automotive world as far as they're like, Oh, that guy built the car in a month, you know, but it's taken me a year. 
And oh, I know yeah. like what you guys said is like you get that car off of the jack stands. Like what what is your guys' take on that? I think it's uh I think it's the same it's just a we live in a culture of instant gratification and I think that mm-hmm. we have like a um well we're, since we're both high school teachers, um I I'm again I'm gonna speak for Hoff here, but I think it's you know, you get we come up against that in our shop classes where kids don't understand how the reality of how long something takes to do or build um, because they've seen it on Instagram a lot or whatever. Right. And then I think, I don't know if like shows like overhaul and started that, but I, I remember working in a shop uh, before I became a teacher and people would be pissed off because is what do you mean? It's going to take six months to do this car. Like TV should like overhaul and does it in like seven days. Well, what you don't see darling is that <laughs> overhaul and um like there's there's a ton of behind the scenes work they get it just slapped together for the camera and then they go through it afterwards right after the the, the reaction of the customer or whatever so i think i think that happens a lot um you could see but i do appreciate there's a there's a change i think especially in the stuff that you do especially in the a lot of the reels that are happening now where you can see the processes because people are starting to understand there's, it's all about like everything is content, right? So if, mm-hmm. if this, if this part of this build, okay, I need to research or refinish these bolts or whatever. I take these bolts out of my motor and I'm not replacing some of these because they're not available. So I'm going to clean them up, get the grease off them, brush them off, paint, whatever. That is, is a minus, it's like a, uh, pers- like a small percentage of the overall build, but that can give you a 60 second reel. And that's more mm-hmm. content going out there. So I think I think we definitely see that, but I think there's a change coming. I don't know about you, Hoff. I appreciate the process. I'm kind of a process guy myself, so I like to. I mean, some of those videos on YouTube and you know the pictures and short clips on Instagram with the finished product and stuff is wicked because it kind of gives you a you know a sense of oh that you know the the final build. But I like to break it down, and I mean, I guess this gets to be a bit hard on YouTube if you've got a you know a four hour video. I'm probably not going to be watching the whole thing, but if you can split it up into smaller chunks, I want to see. And again, the automotive is not really my forte. I'm not really, you know, competent in it, but I like to see the process of, you know, this is how we redid the dash in the C10 or whatnot. So I, I appreciate the process videos a bit more and I'm kind of happy that they're coming out a bit more now instead of just the, oh, here's our finished product. And um, this only took, you know, however long and all the blood, sweat and tears and, the important part is almost missing. So, yeah. I think the process too is more relatable, right? It, it helps you build that relationship with your audience that way. And they can go on that journey with you. And then you've been through something together at the end of it. And hopefully that inspire or that um, communicates to like long-term viewership too. I don't know. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's, I guess where I was going with that initially was that, I feel like some of the process just really sped up on the internet, you know, yeah. like obviously like, like me, like I have a few guys that work with me. So like when we build a car, the process is really fast compared to like, if I was just building it by myself and I feel like I've kind of miss out on a lot of that content now, just because there is a team of guys. And, you know, for example, like I don't, I'm good friends with like Adam LZ um, I don't know if you guys have, have seen any of his stuff, but yep. like, you know, in, initially, like he kind of started off, uh, you know, working on his car in his garage and you've seen almost every nut and bolt that he touched on it. He's swapping this turbo and this is the reason he's, he's switching over to this turbo and here's the response. And now we're going over to the dyno and, um, you know, there, he had a lot of that process, but then as his business escalated and then as his, you know, I guess time was needed in other places and he hired people now. Like he has like a four rotor A90 Supra, you <laughs> yeah. know, that you don't like that almost you haven't seen enough of, you know, like that's an insanely technical car all the way around. But because he has a guy, you know, a team of people, you know, going through that, I feel like the audience, they miss out on how big of a task that is, you know, and they they kind of miss, miss that process as well. I do think that you know, with the, the reels and the short form content, it's, it's harder to, in some aspects, I guess, it's easy to show them minor details in like one reel, 
but it's hard to get somebody to watch like a 30 minute YouTube video anymore. Like I've, yeah. I've noticed that in like my analytics is just the watch time is just so much lower. I feel like people just have less time to sit there and it's less satisfying to watch me work on a car for 30 minutes where, you know, maybe we're swapping an engine and, you know, we go through the process. Of, okay. This one's knocking and we go to the junk car and we pull one and then we, we put this one in or we're going to turbo this car or whatever. Whereas you could just kind of, I feel like as a consumer of content, like you could just sit there and endlessly scroll and just be rewarded in 15 seconds over and over and over and over again. And so that's, that's why I mentioned previously is that I've kind of shifted a lot of my attention to short form content. And that's kind of my plan mo moving forward is still do a lot of the, you know, the, the longer form videos, but how much content can we pull out of that and put on reels? You know, how can we send yeah. somebody on a reels like, or a shorts or, you know, TikTok style journey with my content now? Yeah, you know, I, almost make somebody want to go binge watch your 15 second clips instead of watching your 30 minute video. That's tough too. As long as you, I think that's, I think it's a, oh, that's a tough trade off. Hey, because the, I think the long, the people who are watching the, I mean, it's, it's bad that we're calling half hour video long <laughs> form now. Um, but I think if we, I, the people who are going to watch the long form stuff are going to be loyal consumers. Right. And I think the people who are if you're just going for views, that's fine. But if you're looking to like build a community around what you're doing, um, I don't know if I'm not I'd like to see the I'd like to see how other channels or, you know, like groups are doing it and how like the data on that does does the short form reels um, do they translate to um, like subscribers or do they translate to. Uh, more like a, a loyal customer to, to, to sound old fashioned, but does that, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, cause if your stuff's just in their feed and they watch it, scroll past, like how often do you hit follow or whatever on some, on someone's stuff? Um, just flipping through the feed. I don't know that that's a, that's a tough trade off. Yeah. I mean, in, and I, I feel like you are, you're almost chasing you're chasing that that high view number versus like the long term like relationship with the viewer you yeah. know like mm -hmm. for for example this last month um facebook is doing like a, a reels uh, bonus so uh, you know tiktok there's so many people uploading tiktoks tiktok doesn't really need to pay you or the way that tiktok pays you isn't good but now there's all these other platforms like Instagram Reels. They were doing a bonus program where they would pay creators to start uploading Reels. Uh, and then now kind of a big shift is, okay, like there's so many people uploading Reels on Instagram now because that's the only way to get engagement because the, the algorithm seems to reward Reels more than any other sort of post, whether it's a picture or a video uploaded to your feed. It's, it's, even it, even the videos in your feed, it turns them into a reel automatically. Now there's not even an option to upload a video. It's just it or real. Um, but over the last 30 days or the previous session of 30 days, we got 20 million views on our Facebook reels. Um, obviously I was, I was motivated to post a lot of reels because of, uh, you know, they were doing a bonus program over there. Um, but we got 20 million views in like 30 days wow. in my YouTube channel as a, as a whole at 600,000 subscribers has only, you know, I say only, but it's a hundred million views. So I have a hundred million views over the past, you know, let's say six years of uh, automotive content and build videos and stuff. And in 30 days, I got 20 million views, <laughs> but like you were saying in the last, you know, six years of me doing full-time automotive YouTube, you know, I have 600 K subscribers. Whereas on that 20 million month views worth of views on Facebook, it only translated to about 14,000 new followers. So 
you can see the numbers are a little like it it proves that yes that, that you you're not getting that actual relationship mm-hmm. you're just getting that hit that quick view you know maybe they'll like it maybe they'll share it but they're not actually you know following your page and you're almost relying on the algorithm to serve them more of your content in the future Mm -hmm. you know and yeah it's uh it's definitely a an interesting yeah it's like how do you how do you retain you know that viewer how do you build that relationship to where they they do start following your reels um on it whereas yeah like youtube is is similar but i feel like youtube even even now like i'm it doesn't show me the people that i follow like i could subscribe to a channel and not watch three of the videos that it recommends to me and it'll never show me that channel again you know like Hmm. but the channels that i keep up with are the ones that i kind of am around or that i follow like i'm not even subscribed to them but i feel like i've been subscribed to them for years because i watch all their videos as soon as you know the browse page on youtube pops up and it shows me a new video from this person i click on it or you know if i do continue click it'll 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 show me their next video but as soon as i fall off of that even if i am subscribed like it just stops so i feel like it's mostly the algorithm anyhow so it's like the followers kind of aren't it's not like it used to be on yeah. youtube youtube it was you know when you subscribe to a channel that was the videos that you've seen and it still is you go to your subscription tab on youtube but that's not the first tab that you like is open like you click on youtube and it's automatically in the browse tab and now there's all these titles and thumbnails and stuff that it's trying to recommend for you and it doesn't care about your subscriptions. You know, it wants to send, show you this new latest video from, you know, whoever is doing this, this crazy thing. And uh, yeah, that's just, it it seems like that's kind of, I don't know, like how do you get people on that uh, to to come back, you know, to, to a short form video. Like, I don't know if we've just lost that or if if people are on just like a, it almost be an interesting interesting social experiment to take, say one of your 30 minute videos and break it up into, you know, however many 45 and or whatever, say 30 second clips. So if there's a 30 minute, you know, there'd be like whatever, 60 or 70 of these 30 second clips. I, I would assume I think it would... your shorter stuff's going to do better. But then in the long run, like you're saying, I mean, yeah, everybody wants that initial gratification, that 15, 20 second clip wicked. But do you really like, we're talking about, do you really get viewers from that? I don't know I, if I'm into the, to the YouTube channel, um, and into that specific part of the job, whether it's woodworking, whatever. Um, I'm probably going to watch the longer one if there's a bit more process, but that initial, um, you know, gratification of watching a 20 second, but do you really, do you, do you retain the information from the short clips as much as you would from a 30 minute video where it's, you know, that start stop all the time? I don't know, but I think that goes to show maybe the new generation is, has that shorter attention span and that's what they're going for. I don't know. It's probably, it's probably been different for you too, as a uh, content creator and going through these builds of, you know, say four or five years ago to now just, yeah, like it's, it's crazy. And how do you stay on top of that? And you know, it's, you're probably constantly juggling how you create content and you know, that's going to be hard from the business standpoint too, um, to, to have that change. Yeah. And I think with, you know, talking about like the, you know, converting like a long form video into like short form video, they're almost two, you film them and edit them completely different. Mm -hmm. Like, because if if you just took that 30 minute video, or even let's say it's a 10 minute video, and you broke it up into, you know, a bunch of clips, the clip has to have something in it you know like the beginning the middle of the end it it has to have the story so you have to have that same story between you know the the 10 minute video whereas like that's a really long story you know where you could that's the process whereas almost in like a the shorts video or the 15 second or the under minute like you almost have to break down that process into its own individual processes you know like no kidding yeah, like you were saying previously about like cleaning the bolts, 
like in a 10 minute video, that would be like a time lapse. Yeah. But now that is a 15 second, super satisfying clip, you know, but it's also kind of, you could almost use it for both, um, platforms. You know, you could keep that time lapse video in the normal video. Cause that's a part of the whole process of swapping this engine, you know, is okay. Like we have this junkyard engine that has dirty bolts, you know, and my car doesn't run. We're going to make it run. That's the point of that video. The point of the short video is I have dirty bolts and they need cleaned and that's it, you yeah, know? Yeah. And so there, there's a lot of content opportunity in those, um, in those moments, you know, in that, that longer form video. So it's, yeah, it's, it's weird because they're like completely separate and you have to think of them in a different way, you know, like, um, and it's just weird. Like, I feel like I've kind of got an eye for short content recently. Um, like we were standing, we we're just doing a quick time lapse. We were getting ready to paint a car and, uh, one of the guys that was working with me, he, he started blocking the side of the car. And as you can see, there's like these little, little dents, you know, like a, let's say like a door ding yeah. and it's a black car and he's sanding the side of it with a block and it's the paint is shiny. So as you sand across this dent, you now have this, you know, shiny dark spot. And then this dull side of the, you know, this dull around it. So you could, you could obviously see that there's a dent there, you know, cause it's like, okay, you blocked over it and now you have this, this bowl. And, uh, so, and, and as soon as he was doing that on some of the other dance, I was like, okay, cool. All right. Come over here, right here. Like, and I just like pulled out my phone, put it in vertical. And I was like, all right, ready? Three, two, one. I like, I want you to sand this stent pretty quick, not too much, just enough to get the scratches to where you can see what's done. And then when you're done, wipe it with your hand. And it's a 15 second clip. And it got like 2 million views <laughs> of just something that like was so simple you know, and was like, I would have kind of skimmed across it in my video. Like it was just in a time lapse, essentially. It was like, Hey, we're body working this car. We're going to paint it. That's the process. I've done it a bunch of times, but I was like, this is like prime reels, real estate, you know, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I'm like excited and kind of nervous cause it's, it's something new, but it's insane. The potential of, reels you know there's channels that uh on youtube or on um like facebook or snapchat or even you know facebook or youtube is now monetizing shorts and there was this one guy he had kind of a, a click baity style reel um and he said something he's like i'm leaving youtube doesn't want me on this platform and it was girlfriend in a bikini and i was just like okay that's weird had like 29 million views on it. <laughs> like, and then in that video, he said, go look at my long form video to like explain why. And I must've been one of the only ones to go to his long form video. Cause it had like, this channel has 3 million subscribers in this long form video had like 20,000 views on it. Wow. And it was a 10 minute video of him talking about like why he was moving off of like YouTube because of, you know, their policies and something about bikinis. Cause he was like, but he was literally getting like 200 million views a month on his reels or on his YouTube shorts. And it just is insane. The fact that somebody could go insanely viral, you know, and get a 29 million view video, you know, on a short form piece of content, just in just as easy as somebody gets a hundred views on something, you know, I mean, it's, it's just crazy how exponential, that kind of area is right now and it's like so. it's like the wild west because i've posted a few things like we <laughs> this is the perfect example i think it, um because our instagram page we are we like we just started this this podcast back in june so we're almost at 500 followers yeah go us um so but what what i've noticed i've i've put up some reels and i did a couple I, like a install series thing, a two part thing where I installed a diesel heater in my little single car garage. And the one got 21,000 views. And I was like, holy crap. If half of those people hit follow, like our problems, no problems, but like we'd be well on our way. And then the mm -hmm. next thing I part two to that 7,000 
and then the next video I did spend a lot of time doing this like I have this 51 International has really nice blue and rusty patina and I put a filter on it and I did like Booker T and the MGs that um, Green Onion song you know that cruising song I did the whole thing 2700 right and then it's like what what's the difference like what what is caught or like that you know do you, you see that LS truck rampy it's like a it's it's owned by uh Wayne Dick and he's from here but he did the Burnyard at SEMA this year it's like that orange mm -hmm. um Corvair truck with an LS in it we had yeah. a video of him he he's from our our town um we did a video of a uh, reel of him he took us for a, a rip in his truck 700 you know it's like what is going on? <laughs> I don't even understand. But I think, I think what what we're getting into here is having to balance the two, because if we're too heavy on the reels, then you know your six hundred thousand subscribers who come to you every single week or day, however I forget how often you upload, um, they you don't want to f make them feel shortchanged, but you also like you're trying to make a living too, and mm -hmm. as far as sponsors go, that's short. Um, the short content stuff, that's a gold mine because their brands, let's say you have a brand deal, their brand is being seen 20 million times and you only have to make a 15 second video. So it's like, mm -hmm. there's gotta be a balance. Like, I, I think. Yeah. It's, it's weird too. Cause like I, I'm kind of classifying like my YouTube channel, like I'm kind of leaving that long form and I'm trying to develop a strategy of like how do i upload a short to my youtube channel that is relevant to my current long form videos so how do i upload a, a short that makes somebody want to go watch the long form video and that's why i haven't i haven't really found that yet so that's why i don't really upload that many shorts on youtube whereas i feel like on instagram and facebook the people that are there aren't your subscribers really anyhow. And they're just kind of there for that hit of automotive satisfaction or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and so I basically have two different strategies that I'm kind of, you know, kind of trying to do. But one of the things that is the major difference is that on a long form video, let's say on YouTube, like a thousand views is equals, let's say around $5, oh, okay. you know, on, on a video. Whereas on shorts on YouTube, a thousand views on shorts is five cents. Oh, okay. So it's, it's a way different ratio, obviously, you know, and it, this all depends. Like $5 is about an average. Um, on YouTube, like if there's finance channels that are, you know, let's say they're 10 to $15 per thousand views, there's video gaming channels that are a dollar to $3 per thousand views, just because of, you know, it depends on the value of your audience in Google's eyes on how they pay you is essentially what it is. is. Um, but yeah, the, that's, that's where it's tough is like, I could go and upload a, you know, you basically just have to add zeros, you know, to where like I could upload a video that gets, um, you know, 30,000 views on YouTube and, you know, make something. But then in order to make that same amount, like I would have to have, what would, what would it be? Would it be like a 300,000 view reel or is that a 3 million view reel, you know, to make that same amount yeah. of money? And you, you, got, you got a family um, to feed, right? And you're, you got a lot. There's a lot to think about. That's for sure. Yeah. It's really interesting so where, how things are going. Me being like, okay, I, I need 30,000 views, which I I, tech, I need more than 30,000 views. Um, but like, okay, I need 30,000 views. Now I need 3 million Yeah. on this type of thing. Or, but it's like, okay, my 30,000 view video, I could upload one of those a week. On this short form content, I could upload three to five of those a day. Yeah. You know, so there's... Yeah, it's I'm I'm kind of trying to navigate, you know, this this shift, um, you know, and kind of get in on it early because I know a lot of other people, you know, they're just so busy, you know, with their their normal content, their normal everything. Um, but yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, you know, yeah, you like 
paying bills and trying to do all that other stuff, as well as trying to adapt to this new, you know, attention span of everybody. <laughs> but at so. the end of the day, like, it's just, it's, that's horrible <laughs> for, for our society. Hey, it's like, no one's watching my videos if they're longer than a minute long. Great. Mm -hmm. What does that say about society <laughs> at large? <laughs> well, and, and I've listened to some Mr. Beast podcasts and I think a lot of, a lot of it is that, you know, people just don't want their time wasted. Yeah, you know, that's like fair. I'm that's sure fair. Yeah, that's fair. you, you get on, like if, if I'm going to upload a video, a 30, like, I go back to like the junkyard engine swap, like a 30 minute video of me swapping an engine in a car. If I could have made that video eight minutes long and it got the same point across in a more fun, highly energetic, more satisfying, you know, way like am i just wasting my audience's time by uploading that 30 minute video that's you a know, good point when it though. could have been eight that's a really good point right mm -hmm. is it and it's forcing it's forcing creators to be more creative maybe exactly yeah and you know again a, a lot of it just comes down to not wasting the audience's time because they have infinite options if you waste their time on your video they might not ever come back yeah you know yeah if you know, it's just like if, if somebody doesn't like the way you talk or the way you look or whatever, they're just like, oh, like I, I don't really, or they don't like your car, they don't like Mopars, you know, or or Chevys. They're like, and they see that you you're working on a Chevy, that they might not care about you anymore. They're like, oh no, the only thing I'm here for is Mopar content. And you you bought a Chevy or, you know, like that type of 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 thing. But um, but yeah, I mean, just really and it's kind of interesting because I feel like certain like almost the old school classic, like I feel like it's a different demographic that watch those videos. Um, you know, so I think that people that do work on older cars can get away with a longer form video because their viewer is a little bit older and is maybe in more of a niche. Yeah. So they could get more in detail in depth because, you know, maybe you're the only, creator that's uploading Mopar content, old school Mopar content, whereas everybody else is, there's 15 people uploading 240SX drift videos, you know, yeah. and you're the only, yeah, you know, so there's, there's, um, there's a lot, I don't know, there's a lot of strategies. I mean, I, I think about this stuff a lot, you know, I mean, I, I have to, it's, it's, it's how I make a living now. So do you find, um, do you find this change takes away from like your projects, the building, the, you know, the getting your hands dirty and working on these project cars, do you find that it kind of almost consumes you a little bit on, you know, how do I get into the right direction versus I just want to get on this vehicle and build or, you know, the, your projects that you have kind of lined up? Oh yeah. I think that, you know, escalating the business to a, to the point where I guess it kind of is right now. I'm, I'm in like no man's land right now. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not by myself, but I'm not super, successful to where like you know the money's flowing and you could have employees and you could have everything it's like i need help so i need employees for certain stuff you know but then the issue is is that you're not like making enough to like have like a full-time employee but then you're like well if i need a full-time like if i had a full-time employee to do this then i it would free up my time to do this other stuff so i guess recently what like i used to do everything you know yeah build the engines paint the engine bay do the wiring, do the paint, do the body work, do the interior, film the videos, edit the videos, upload the videos. Literally like 110% was me. Like with, I'd wear 10 different hats a day. Um, whereas, you know, recently I've, uh, you know, hired some people or, you know, worked with friends and a lot of that hands-on stuff has kind of taken a back seat because now, you know, instead of me just out there working on the car, I'm like, okay, well now I have to figure out how the business is going to make money to where I could pay somebody to work on that car. Yeah. And it, it pulls, I feel like a lot of my creativity out of it, you know, and, and a lot of those moments that, you know, like maybe during the video, like, like I'll, I'll set a time lapse up and, and let one of the, the guys just get to work on something. Whereas, and I'll go in the office and I'm, you know, answering emails or doing phone calls or paying bills and, you know, figuring out tax stuff. And I mean, it's just crazy how I guess it's, like I said, it's kind of that, that, that no man's land of doing stuff. Cause it's like, I need help, but I can't afford help, you know? 
and, and yeah. to get to that point. So like, I, I'm just kind of still almost doing everything, but in a different way, you know, like, um, it's like, like, I feel like it's for almost the like, videos, it's almost like when you like where you have the dream where you dreamt to get to you're, you're, it sounds like you're there, but it's also makes you not able to do what you wanted to do in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the thing I started the channel with the most was me working on cars. And now it's like, I almost don't even work on cars anymore. I'm just like paying bills and like, you know, like figuring out the business side of things in order to be able to be like around the cars or with the cars and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty much exactly what you said. It, it does like, you know, pull you kind of out of it, yeah. you know? And, um, and that's one thing that I'm kind of debating on recently. I had a friend that I was working with, he worked with me for the past two years and, um, he kind of split off and did his, kind of went on to do his own thing. He was, you know, he was kind of always buying and selling stuff and kind of has a shop set up at his house. And, um, you know, initially like when he started working with me, his life was less complicated. So, you know, his, his overhead at home wasn't as expensive, but as his life progressed and, you know, he he got married and had a kid and then, you know, that type of stuff. Now he needed to make more money, but he also didn't have as much time to dedicate as he initially did. Yeah. But like, I scaled up the business in the aspect of like, okay, now I have to pay two people, you know, from this, but like, so now the overhead is really expensive. You know, it's like, we have a big shop. We have, you know, two posts, we have two, we have a 5,000 square foot shop. We have two, two post lifts. We have a paint booth. We have, you know, a quarter acre of, of land. We have like this junkyard we have access to and do all this stuff. And then now, he recently decided to do his own thing. So now like, that's kind of all on my shoulders now. I'm like, you can't do that with one person. Especially now when oh, it's, it's such a tough spot. It seems like you're in right now. And I'm sorry to hear that because it's like, you're doing this, you've expanded the business. And then now you're trying to, f- the whole landscape that you have been used to um, earning, uh, earning a living on has completely changed. And you're like, um, what the hell do I do now? <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. And that's why I'm just, I'm in, in a tough position is because it's like, what do you do? Do I, do I scale it back down? Do I go way back to basics? Cause I, I'm pretty fortunate. I, uh, I sold my house um, kind of at the peak of, of everything, you know, during all the COVID crazy prices. And I actually got into another house that has a, a shop on it. So uh I have like a 1600 square foot shop at my house, which was like, we were doing all of our merchandise fulfillment and stuff for the giveaways there. You know, so we had like, you know, racks of t-shirts and, you know, oh, yeah, we had a yeah. heat press there and we would make stuff and we had, you know, pretty much everything we did in house. Um, so recently I, I'm i working with another company where they print and fulfill. That was a big issue that we had was just like, you know, we were sourcing everything locally. So we'd be like a local screen printer. We'd be like, Hey, we need, these t-shirts, these hoodies, these whatever. Um, But with the giveaway model, it's tough to anticipate that if you're going to sell, you know, 30 of a shirt or a hundred of a shirt. And so our orders weren't super big because we didn't want to have a bunch of stuff left over at the end. But then when the time would come to finally put in an order, like they'd be like two to three weeks out. And I'm like, I can't sell stuff, you know, without having it like really in stock, but then I can't have customers waiting, you know, three, four weeks before they get their stuff. So, uh, ended up finding another company that basically does the same exact thing with other, uh, people that do giveaways and sweepstakes. And so they print in house and they fulfill in house. And so that took a huge weight off of my shoulders. Cause not only was I, you know, working at the separate shop during the day, you know, doing that stuff, trying to do videos, trying to keep projects going along. Then at night when I would get home, it's like, okay, after dinner, we got to go outside and start shipping stuff too, um, you know, and handling customer emails. And it, and it was just a lot, but now that has, that shop is essentially kind of open. I still have, I have too many cars, but, um, <laughs> no one, no one does. No there. one does. And, uh, so yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to find that balance between like, do I, you know, reduce my overhead like out here at this shop, which this shop is set up. Like if we had four, you know, three to four people here, like we could do a lot of work, you know, and, and get a lot of projects done and, 
and all that stuff. But it's like, am I missing out on, you know, like at that point, like, what do I do if I have four employees? Like, unless I have like a business manager and I'm out there working on the cars, like, I feel like I'm going to be let, I'm going to work on the cars less. So it's like, do I bring it back and pull everything back home and try to do everything myself again? You know, as far as like the working on the cars and just kind of simplify it, then I don't have to, you know, I don't have this crazy overhead. So I don't have to have like a, you know, employee type of thing in order to kind of like work and hopefully make money to like be able to pay for this stuff. It's like, if it's scaled down enough, then can I focus more? Will the videos be better? You know, like, I don't know that that's kind of what I'm in between right now is like, do I scale up because I know the potential? You know, and I know what it could be with a team of of a lot of people. But then again, you're you're running into how do you find them for right people, four or five people. It's almost you know? like it's almost what like they, do I go down to the grassroots, back to grassroots of how we got started? Is that is that what it, we got to do it, here? Yeah, and that's what I'm kind of kind of looking at. And I'm like, well, I have like thirty some cars. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of cars to finish, but um, but yeah, that's that's kind of one of the things that. I guess is, is going on with me now. And, um, you know, definitely it's going to be a challenge either way, you know, and I, and I guess at this point it's just like choosing it's like, what do, what do I want? What do I want it to look like? Yeah. Um, which is a pretty cool, uh, situation to be in really like a big picture. It's a pretty cool situation to, it's like, it's not a, it's not a bad decision to have to make, you know, but getting, getting into like, so now you said you have 30 cars you got to finish and what would be, if you're getting, you know, you have this vision for your business and for the channel and you have this kind of dream that you want to achieve by getting like bringing it back to cars for a second, what would be like a dream build of yours that you haven't already know, done? I, I feel <laughs> is because I've had the last, you know, let's say the last three years to really like almost kind of pick and choose like anything that I want to do, as long as I can make enough videos about it or, you know, I could almost build anything you know, if, if I really wanted to. And I think that's kind of what, I don't know, I, if it was going to be a specific car, like obviously my Datsun 510, that's, that's one of those builds where I'm like not ready for it yet because I just, I want it to be perfect. You know, like I want to really have the time to dedicate to it. And I feel like right now I'm, I'm kind of too busy running the business and it's hard for me to take that much time away for not necessarily like, a passion project but like a lot of the builds and stuff that we do right now like with the giveaways and stuff like you know we build the car and then we do a giveaway on it so that in turn brings in money so whereas like the dots and if i start working on it really the only revenue that will be coming in is the youtube revenue which isn't technically enough to handle the overhead so then i'm kind of like i can't do that yet you know so like um but when I was uh, when I was young, in one of my uncles in Arkansas, there's this uh, this car. It's a 41 wheelies coupe. It has a like a blown like 540 some cubic inch Hemi in it, and it's called the Frantic Frog. It's like this lime green, just insanely beautiful 41 wheelies coupe. It's all steel. The bottom of it is just like as clean as the top of it, like you know, chrome polished everything. Like it's like they cut and buffed the bottom of it you know the bottom of the car is the same colors the the top but i've always wanted to build like an old school like wheelie's coupe or i guess not necessarily old school style but like i want to build a wheelie's coupe with like a new style like new technology like something different instead of just putting a 500 some cubic big block in it do like a turbo 2 jz and then like <laughs> and take a lot of pure off but it'd be wicked <laughs> Yeah. And then in, instead of like the, you know, the old school, like 15 inch wheels with the 30 some inch wide tire or whatever on the back, or I think they're like, like those crazy Mickey Thompson's that are insanely wide, like do like some T37s or something crazy like that. And then make it like all wheel drive with like a sequential transmission and make it actually run and drive well, instead of just being able to like go in a straight line. You know, I think something like that is, um, is definitely kind of one of those, you know, more of a classic style build for me. But I think another type of thing is 
that I would like to do is more of like a full tube chassis, like almost like an F1 style car that is like, has some sort of a body on it. That's it's resembles that car, but it's not that car anymore. You know, it's like if, um, you know, a car manufacturer had to put, you know, their OEM body on an F1 car. Like, I think something like that would be cool. So that'd be uh, rad. And I think that would be, you know, and that would be kind of a huge challenge. I don't know if you guys have seen like Ryan Turek's, uh, that ST, the Stout, that Toyota truck that he built hmm. at SEMA. Um, probably to see it off, like by name, I can't, rec- I can't uh, remember it, but. Okay. Yeah. But it, they did a pretty cool build series, but you know, it, I guess I just liked the integration of all the technology. They took this stock 60s um, Toyota truck, completely 3D scanned it, pulled everything into, you know, a CAD file, built a full tube chassis, sent it to a chassis builder. They built, kind of built it like a trophy truck. Um, You know, everything, the cage was all built. Everything was CAD designed. They built, uh, again, with the 3D scan model, they built like a wide body. They took it to like this CNC, like mold, they they basically made a mold for the fiberglass body kit out of like a CNC mill, you know? So, and it was all from the computer. So it was like, they almost built the car on the computer, but then, you know, obviously put the pieces together in real life based upon all the CAD stuff, you know, but it was like, they have a bender, you know, with the, you know, all the right stuff in it to where it laser notches on the tube of, okay, start this bend here. And then you put it in the thing. You're like, okay, bend to 24 degrees. And, so it's like, it's, it's interesting. I w- it's a lot of technology that went into that whole, you know, thing. Like they were designing the cage and the chassis around the fuel cell. You know, they 3D scan the fuel cell and they're like, okay, now we have to integrate this into our tube chassis. And I think <laughs> that that hilarious. level is pretty crazy, you know? Yeah, no and, kidding. Uh, obviously, I don't think that's, that's right now. Yeah, uh, I think... I'm not sure if it was Donut Media or I think Ryan Turk, he actually did a pretty good build series on his actual personal YouTube channel. And uh, I know like I'm familiar. I talk about him, you know, cause I'm, I'm used to like the, you know, drifting and kind of the import stuff. I don't know if, if he's kind of in your guys's like world as far as people you, you keep up with, but uh, it was a really, really cool build. Um, and uh, the other you know, kind of car that would be kind of an inspiration would be like Ken Blocks, the Huna Pegasus, that oh, yeah. pink Porsche that they yeah. they just did. So uh, I'm in Colorado. I'm actually only about 45 minutes away from the Pikes Peak, um, you know, the the mountain where they do the hill climb and everything on. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually seen seen that car. I seen it at, at SEMA and I seen it when it was here. I'd actually did some testing at the local track, um, our local track, which is like, you know, not too far from my shop, which is is pretty cool but um that is yeah cool. it's uh it's crazy that's uh, wow but, yeah, what, we went to I, I went to wyotech in 05 and we went to the hill climb when i was down there and it, mm-hmm. it's wild to see all the, all that stuff and and especially i love the the builds where they take the technology um kind of like what you're talking about they take the technology to the next level and they put it into i maybe the word resto mod would be would apply but um, the the car. I don't know if the vehicles are old enough to call it a resto for the resto part of that, but like they mm-hmm. like it's newer technology that the car came with, but it just takes the car to a whole new level. Plus, it's wrapped in this beautiful like what whatever your favorite car might be. It's wrapped in this cool car that that um, can just haul ass and and turn actually turn in the corners like you said with that with that um, car you were talking about earlier. It actually can function mm-hmm. instead of just going in a straight line. Yeah, exactly. Like I would say another build that, that they did was the, the Hunicorn, you know, like the all wheel drive twin turbo, uh, V8 sequential makes 400 horsepower. Um, you know, just insane car Yeah. And literally the only thing that's stock on it is like the sheet metal, you know, that's like, <laughs> they just completely had to cut up everything to get it to even fit on there. But it's just this insane 
insane car. I think so that, that car um, was groundbreaking too. I think it set it set the course for a lot of people. Maybe gave people permission to do something like that. I think yeah, also it was executed so well. Oh yeah, and it just like I remember seeing that that first uh, was it that Jim Connor? I don't know what number that was when the unicorn, um, the the first one where he's hooked up to the the chain there, and then he hits the button and he goes. Just like mm-hmm. as when I I got so pumped when I watched that video, it's just like so I've never seen anything like this before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like so. How do you you know that almost sets the like kind of us that sets the bar, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like now what? Like what do you do? What do you do now? Obviously, like they didn't build that in their garage. Like it wasn't like some some guy you know that just spent a year building that thing. That was a team of you know highly specific you know, craftsmen, you know, super yeah. like experts in the, in their, their own areas that all came together to put, put a car like that together. So, um, well, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm not saying you're doing this, but don't sell yourself short either. You, you guys turn out some pretty cool stuff as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we wanted to get you on here. So question for you, um, for someone who wants to, to kind of dive into this field, get started in building cars, um, whether it's on the side or as a career, um, what's some general advice you'd have for someone who just wants to break into the industry? And I, I could slice that like 10 different ways. Cause I, <laughs> that's why um, it's such an open-ended question, but we love it open-ended cause it, the, it gives our, our guests an opportunity to just go take it whatever way they want. Yeah. I would say the biggest thing is start, you know, what is the reason, you know, why, why do you, why do you want the car? You know, cause I feel like cars, you know, they're multi-purpose, you know, obviously they're either forms of transportation. Do you want the car just because you want to get good mileage? Do you, you know, because you, you have a, a two hour commute to work, you know, and so you need to get something that has makes, gets 50 miles a gallon. Like, is it that, is it because, you know, like you want to have a group of friends, you know, to like work on cars with, or do you want to go to the track? you know, and build friendships or relationships or just have like a lifestyle, you know, cause that's, that's the other thing that's, that's interesting is like, uh, you know, sometimes I compare cars to like drugs, um, you know, like, <laughs> like car <cocaine>. if, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, like, like almost if you, it, they, they almost simplify your life in a certain aspect because then that is all you're worried about either way, you it's know, good, whether it's, it's drugs a good or point. Cars, yeah. It's like, once you, once you kind of go down that path of cars, your life, it, as complicated as it gets, it's like it turns into like, how do I go faster? How do I, you know, what car meter are we going to tonight? Or what road course event that I can I do tonight? Or in, in, in my terms, it's like my whole entire life is now consumed. Like if, if I was a drug addict, I would be the, the great one. You know? <laughs> the like, best drug addict ever. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, cause like that's, that's it. So it's like, I guess finding the purpose and then find something that you, you would like, you know, obviously the style of car, if, if you're not, if you're not, if you're into like BMWs and Mercedes and, you know, or JDM cars, if you go out and you're trying to work on a car with your uncle and he's working on, you know, uh, an old school small block Chevy, like you're probably not even going to care about it, but yeah. I would say finding something that you care about do the research, find probably a local group of people or, you know, get out into an area where you could see that car, where you could touch it, where you could talk to the people about a similar car. You know, if you're into drifting, go to a drift event. If you like two forties, probably go to a drift event, you know, or get on a forum. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I mean, forums, Facebook groups, watch YouTube videos. Um, You know, I think that's another cool thing about like, kind of in the YouTube world, you know, I guess here in the United States, you know, Adam, he's had a hosted a couple like events. There's events like grid life now yep. uh, to where you could go and you could like, you could go to a grid life event here in Colorado and meet me, shake my hand, look at my car, you know, talk about stuff. Um, and learn that. And I would way, say hey? just, exactly. And, you know, again, you could go to a local drift event and find somebody with a 240 that has an RB25 in it. And you're like, Oh, like I, I love RB25s. This thing sounds so cool. Like, how did you make it sound like that? What turbo do you got on it? And you know, they're going to pop you their hood, start talking about it, you know, and you could just learn that. And 
I would say the biggest thing is just uh, obviously just starting, you know, is like, yeah, find either the car, you know, that you want or like 240 SX on Marketplace, but it's like literally a rolling shell. Like it's not even a rolling shell. Like you have to like forklift it onto a trailer. That's probably not a good car to buy, but if you're like, okay, <laughs> you find a reasonable project, you know, you find a 240 that, and that's what you've always wanted. Maybe it needs an engine swap. Well, you could buy an engine, unbolt that one and bolt in another one. And now you have a car. Yeah. But if you buy one that's completely, you know, disassembled, it's going to be tough to get that back to a point to where you could actually enjoy it, which was probably the whole point of even wanting a 240 in the first place. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So I'd say, you know, setting a realistic kind of baby steps into it. Um, you know, engine swaps, as complicated as they are, they're easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you buy something that needs paint and body work, it's a lot more complicated. If you buy something that needs, you know, crazy wiring stuff, or it's, you know, you bought a 240 and it has some, imagine if you bought a 240 and it had like a B, a modern BMW engine in it. And you're like, how am I going to wire that thing? You know, like, yeah. like that's tough. Whereas you could buy an SR20, you know, car, call up wiring specialties and they'll send you a harness and it'll plug in and you could turn the key and it works, yeah. you know? So there's the research part I would say is that, but yeah, that's, that's why I said I could, I could keep going. On here, so. <laughs> it's all good. No, like you, can, you can really tell you're passionate and it's inspiring actually to, to hear that, to hear your advice, to just, just start, you know? Um, I think though, for, from what, just working in high schools and stuff, people, kids are big consumers of content. And, um, and I think sometimes getting back to our, what, you know, what we were talking about, um, people's understanding about how long stuff actually takes, um, or just how big a job things are. Like kids will come by because they know I'm into cars and stuff and they, they'll come by and start talking and then say, Oh, I want to get this car, but I want to do like an LS swap to it. Like they'll, they'll drop all this popular nomenclature, right? All the popular language of the uh, right now and, and, uh, of, of all the stuff that they see online. I'm like, do you, do you really, do you understand though? Like how, what that takes like you don't even have a toolbox like <laughs> you know you want to say this you know so do you do you see that well, a lot it, like when you're at a show to kids but like you got to be careful though because you want to inspire them too right <laughs> you don't want to like bring them down um do you do you come across that a lot yeah i mean in you know i i always remember i always kind of refer to this i go back to like one of i got a dm on instagram um uh, you know it was same i would say like same exact scenario but like somebody was like, Oh, I want to put a V8 in my Toyota Camry. You know, like I want to put a NASCAR V8 in my Toyota Camry. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just, like, and I, you know, based upon this guy's profile, it was a kid, you know, like he, he never turned a ranch or did anything like that. And I think that it's, it's kind of that baby steps type of thing, you know, is you kind of have to ease yourself into it or at least be, you know, confident, super confident and stubborn you know, to be able to push through something like that. And in your example of like a, a LS swap, like the cheapest part about that whole entire swap is the LS, you know, like yeah, yeah, everything yeah. that goes around it, you know, it's like, Oh, I could go to the junkyard and get a $300 LS. And then you're like, okay, well now I got to buy this, you know, $300 wiring harness or the $600 wiring harness. And then this radiator yeah. and these adapters and now a drive shaft. And people don't realize that, you know, if you go buy a drive shaft from your local, um, you know, shop that's going to be like, you know, three to $600 for just a drive shaft when your engine costs $300. Yeah. And you then know? you get and it all like, ready to what? fire and you start it up and it knocks and then, and then you got to do that. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, now I, now I have to, so, you know, I think kind of baby stepping <laughs> into a certain, you know, realm or at least have people around you that could, could support you in that. Like, let's say you want to LS swap, you know, your truck or your C10, like, do you know anybody who has, who has done that before? Maybe you could work with them or maybe your uncle's done it or maybe your neighbor or your friends or whatever. And you're like, okay, like I'll come and help you clean up your shop or whatever. If you, you know, I'll come hang out while you work on your car. Like is somebody else local working on their car that you could go and learn? And it's a similar car to what you want to build. Or I guess it's kind of like that, get your foot in the door of like, you know, how can you get in with a group of people, you know, a group of friends that could help you along that way? Because yeah. just doing, 
doing stuff in your garage by yourself kind of sucks. Oh, you of know? course. And um, it's like surrounding yourself with people who have the same, uh, the same interests as you, right? So that you can all grow kind of together that way. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Um, so taking that next step further, are there any specific skill sets you think that are important to develop when, when diving into this area? I would say that a lot of it is just, I don't know, there's so much information online now that like you could almost figure out how to do anything. You know, like I said be, before, you could get on YouTube and find videos of how to break down body work. You could find videos of, you know, how to, um, you know, how to wire an LS and the, the information is out there. And I would say that the biggest skill is just like kind of the, like the determination to figure it out, you know, is like, just be willing to figure it out and continue with it. And also like, you know, one of the guys, you, what you guys mentioned is like, you know, get the car off of the, the jack stands is like the, the, you have to have the, the discipline to say like, I'm going to go out there and work on that car, you know, instead of being like, Oh, I'm going to wait until I'm motivated to do it. Because if you're, if you will wait until you're motivated. Sometimes you're going to be motivated. Sometimes you're not, you know, but if you yeah. go out that in, in the garage, every single night you say, I'm going to go out in the garage from 8 PM until 10 PM after dinner or whatever. I'm going to work on my car for two hours, whatever it is, you know, versus saying, Oh, when I'm motivated, I'll go out there, you know, cause then when you're motivated, you might go out there once a week, Yeah. but if you're disciplined, you'll go out there every night. Yeah. And I would say you have to have the skill to have the discipline to, <laughs> yeah, to build the skill. <laughs> To build the skills, yeah, and and really, it's just you know, research, trying it out, and uh, you know, I guess the the unwillingness to not, you know, finish it. Yeah, because like motivation, with I don't know, mo I think motivation or lack of motivation is just fleeting, like feelings, like being tired or being hungry, right? It's just if you're not motivated, well, you could you could not be motivated for six months, right? But as soon as exactly. you get out there and you see the progress you've made, I mean, we kind of, Huff and I have that with the show kind of too sometimes when we're like after, a, you know, if we record, let's say on like a Friday after work, um, and then he'll come over and we'll both be like, oh, we're exhausted. But then we do it. And then at the end of it, we're like, oh, that was awesome. Like you're charged up, you're excited, you know, and I think that's the same for any sort of garage project. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I think it's cool. So now going down a little more specific, um, if someone's starting out, what are the top three starting out tools that you think someone should have when, when getting like, you um, know, building a car or, or becoming, you know, like getting in the automotive industry somehow? I would say, you know, obviously the, I just go back to the internet. You know, the internet is, is probably <laughs> yeah, the yeah. number one. Internet access. Tool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> internet access. Um, <laughs> and, you know, cause that's, I mean, that's like, that's like your how to book. I mean, any, anything you, you want to do, uh, I mean, basic hand tools is, is obviously like a, a necessity and, and some of that stuff. I mean, you don't have to have a big, crazy, you know, fully decked out snap on box, like somebody at a, uh, you know, at a dealership would be. Um, but I, I would almost like say, start your projects with, kind of the tools that you either have available to you or ones that you could or like barrier of, of entry you know like most people have a uh you know let's say a like a drill like a, at their house you know yeah. so kind of starting out i would almost i guess this is how i started out is like how i learned a lot of stuff was i wanted to make money so i turned to buying and selling cars and that turned into buying cheap cars that had issues. But then you you got to look at the cars like, what is a realistic thing that I could do? What is a skill that I know I have to where I could fix this car? And what is something that is potentially easy to learn? So it's like, okay, here's a car that it has a minor front end wreck. You know, so it's like, okay, I need to replace the headlight, the fender, the bumper. Okay, now I need to know how to paint, you know, that stuff. Or I need to, you know, figure out how I'm going to pull this radiator support out. Or it could be something as simple as this car has is listed with terrible pictures, you know, on it. But I have a good I, I have an iPhone and a vacuum and a drill <laughs> yeah, that a I vacuum. can polish yeah. the headlight with he, headlights with, you know. So it's like 
I'm going to go buy this car that was, you know, obviously like had terrible pictures. It was dirty. It just needs cleaned up. The headlights are, are terrible. So like the only tool you really need is a vacuum and a drill with a headlight polishing kit. And now you could potentially make a thousand dollars just by relisting this car with better pictures and actually cleaned, you know, with polished headlights. And like, so that kind of gives you that motivation. You're like, okay, what is the reason? Why am I, why am I doing this? But like, you know, in that process, when you're, you're working on that car, you're like, okay, well, the radio doesn't work or, you know, it's a Honda and we lost the code. So now I'm going to go to the, you know, Walmart and I'm going to buy a $30 freaking radio to throw in here. So now I'm going to learn how to wire really quick, yeah. you know, and, and <laughs> kind of stepping up your skill set as you go. And then at the end of it, you're like, okay, now I just made a thousand dollars profit on this thing. Now I could buy some more tools, you know? instead of buying all the tools in the world and not even knowing how to use them, you know, it's like you, you kind of, you know, baby step yourself into it. And, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I always go back to the buying and selling cars is because you could kind of practice, you know, you could practice all your skills on a car that you could potentially get paid to, you know, it, it it's like, you know, kind of paying yourself to go through college, you know, it's like that's you're learning really, as you go. That's a really cool I've never thought of it that way. Like I've had a couple projects recently. I had an old, I had a, a Ranger. Actually, I was, I was watching your videos about your, about your Ranger swap there. And, uh, I was really close to doing that, the diesel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that, that, and then I ended up selling it and I made, I made, I probably made about $1,500 on that, on that swap. I bought it for really cheap. It had a, I thought it was a head gasket, but it ended up being the, um, it was a four liter in one of the water jacket, um, on the intake manifold gasket one, around one of the water jackets, it just started leaking and it puked out all the coolant and th the guy thought it was a head gasket and I was like, okay, well, if it's a head gasket, I'm only going to pay this. And then thank God it ended up not being a head gasket, but, um, it was just that little, that little gasket around the, on that water jacket. So I ended up being able to flip that. And I uh, made some money for my pro other, my international project. And it's just like, but I never thought of it as, Hey, like I learned how to do this and I'm getting paid for it. Like, it's kind of, you're just, like you said, you're just funding your own education. That's a really cool way of looking at that. Yeah. And then, you know, if let's say it was a head gasket and then you did it and then you realized it wasn't too bad. Now you would be searching, you'd be praying to find a ranger that needed a head gasket because yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you knew how to you knew how to do it now or if you've seen something else that needed a head gasket you know even though you never did it before you took a chance on this you learned how to do it Ho hopefully everything worked out you made some money now if something else pops up that needs a head gasket you're like Psh, I'll do that no problem yeah. you know and then again and that's that's why I mean it just kind of worked like that for me naturally because it was out of necessity i had to make money to support my car addiction you know of of building you know my Datsun or the mustang or or my dirt bikes or any of that stuff so it was like that's just how how it worked you know and if i painted a bumper on a civic and it was the first time i painted it you know and, and it wasn't the best paint job in the in the the world well it didn't really matter a whole lot because it was just it wasn't like it was my dream car it was a $2,000 Honda Civic that now is all one color, you know? So not only did I learn how to do that, somebody else got a better car because it's, you know, now it's, it's painted. It's all one color. Most people just rattle can stuff. I painted it legit. I learned how to do it. I learned my mistakes, but it's one of those things where I'm not worried about it. And I'm going to completely re redo the car because it has to be the first car I ever built had to be perfect, yeah. you know, show car SEMA thing. It was like, cool. Like it's, it's an, it, it's just, it just works. You know, that whole process, that whole. Yeah. Yeah. Kind it's of, like what Dave, David Freiberger says, don't get it perfect. Just get it running. <laughs> yeah. As far as projects go. Oh man. Well, I and could... then in that process too, you learn how to get it perfect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Eventually. Eventually. You know? Yeah. But it's still like you're, you're not going to learn how to make it perfect if you don't try to make it perfect. There's a t-shirt yeah, for exactly. you. <laughs> oh man, Trevor, I could, I could go on forever. This is, uh, this has been a, we got to have you come back for a, for a second part. 
I think that'd be yeah, awesome. I'm down. This is, uh, I've been, you know, honestly, this is the first podcast I've technically been on. Really? Um, so, uh, I appreciate the opportunity with, uh, with you guys. I think it's really cool. I think what, what you guys are doing and, you know, kind of the whole model, you know, of, you know, how to hopefully motivate people. And that's kind of what I've been trying to do in my videos. Um, you know, is, is how do I, how do I motivate people? How do I, what are the issues that I run into that I could, you know, hopefully walk somebody through on a build mm. like this. And, um, so I think it's really cool. I've, uh, you know, I've thought about doing a podcast previously, but I'm just uh, kind of at that time stage. I don't have a whole lot of time anyhow, but, uh, yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree. We could, we could go for hours. As you can tell, I, I like, um, I like chatting about this stuff. Oh, it's and, awesome. Um, you can tell your you passion. Guys, uh, you can really tell you're passionate about it. And it really comes also like what you said about trying to help people. It really comes through in your videos too. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate, uh, you know, appreciate all the people who've, uh, who've been following me all the years and, you know, you guys for reaching out. I think this has been really cool. So yeah, it's awesome. So as we kind of wrap up the episode here, uh, where can people find you if they, if they have, if they've been living under a rock for a few years, where can, where can they find you? Um, and is there anything that you have coming up that you want to promote? Um, I would say, uh, yeah, pretty much everything is just motion auto TV. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm on, obviously YouTube is the, is the main thing. Um, so you know, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, I'm on Snapchat. I really don't do much with TikTok. Um, it's kind of an interesting, you know, platform, but, uh, I, um, yeah, the, the upcoming stuff, we're actually getting ready to build a, um, twin engine Honda Civic. Uh, this has been one of those crazy ideas that have been in my, um, um, in my head for a while. Uh, so, we're going to put two K series engines, one in the front and one in the back. We're going to start it <laughs> off with, you know, just the engine in the back. So I guess if there was something uh, that I was looking to promote, I would uh, appreciate it. I guess if, if you're, uh, you know, your listeners or viewers would uh, go check out the channel um, in the coming weeks and see, see what we're building, um, you know, or I guess see the process. Uh, we'll go back to the process, the process of how we're going to build that yeah, thing yeah, and yeah. make two, en two engines work in the Civic. So, um, so yeah. That's incredible. I'm uh, as a previous, well, previous. I'm a, I'm a Honda. Like that was my first. Well, my first car was a Trans Am. My second car was a '93 Civic. Um, it was, it was a sedan. It wasn't a hatch, two door. And that was talk about like going back to the head gasket thing. Um, my head gasket blew. I didn't know how to fix it. It was a D series. It would have been the easiest head gasket to fix of all time, but I didn't know that, and I sold it for really cheap. So, <laughs> so that. I literally, that was my bread and butter was like D series Hondas, small front end wrecks, head gaskets, knocking engines, whatever. That was like, I, I just, I would just sit there and scour Craigslist. Cause that was the first car I ever did head gasket on was that. And it was like, you know, <laughs> I awesome. knew that I could, I could buy and sell one of those and it's probably turn mine. It around really quick. Cause I did it before. It was probably mine. <laughs> I mean, probably like I, it, it honestly, it could have been if you, if you were selling a Honda Civic between 2007 <laughs> and 2012 in Colorado. Yeah. And I needed a head gasket and some guy showed up with an F 250 and a Toto call. It might've been me. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, right on. This has been, this has been awesome. And we'll put the links to all your social media and stuff, um, in the show notes of this, of this episode. So for all of us listening, uh, for everyone listening, uh, Trevor, thanks again for your time today. We really appreciate you having on, having you on, and sharing your, your just your passion for everything. You got you got so many irons in the fire, and it's really inspiring. So hopefully, this conversation inspired people to get out and uh, build something cool. Yeah, I hope I hope so too. And everybody needs to start making reels and posting them on Facebook. Yeah, there we go. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Hoff for being here with us as well. And for everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next one.